appointed the personal representative in a deceased probate estate in Michigan, and now it's time to present the inventory. Hi, I'm Darren Finling of The Probate Pro. We're going to walk step by step through Form PC577, that is a state court administrator form, for the preparation of the required inventory. This form is required under both Michigan statute as well as Michigan court rule. We strongly urge you to use an experienced, competent probate lawyer when completing this form and to refer to the statutes and court rules that identify how to complete the form. We're going to explain how this form works, specifically how you complete it and then what the rules are relating to service. This form must be presented to the probate court within 91 days of the appointment of the personal representative. Now notice I didn't say the word filed because in Michigan, the presentation of the inventory in an unsupervised administration is the requirement. What does that mean? It means that you bring the inventory down to the probate court. The probate court looks at it and calculates the gross inventory fee. It does not require the filing of the inventory unless the estate is supervised or ordered by the probate court that it must be filed. It's an important consideration because the idea in Michigan is that unless it's a supervised administration, the inventory and the assets identified within the inventory are kept private, private among those that are interested within the estate. So after the form is presented to the probate court and the inventory fee is identified or determined, then it must be served upon the interested persons as defined under the Michigan court rules. Now this particular form gets uh, completed and then served upon the interested parties and that gross inventory fee must be paid either before the sworn st statement to close is filed, the, the order for complete administration or petition for the filing for the closing or within one year. Failure to do this or any of these steps subjects the personal representative to a deficiency which could cause removal or sanction. Now at the top of this form in the red box, you'll, you'll see that there's a little checkbox for whether this is an amended inventory or the original inventory. That box would be only checked if you're amending this and it had already been presented. Below in that red box identifies the, the court rules and statutes as well as the form. Let's work our way through this document. These are pretty intuitive areas to fill out. Top left corner identifies the county in which the probate court is filed, and then the file number is identified in the top right corner. Moving further through the document identifies the name of the deceased estate, as well as the personal representative that is completing the inventory. In addition, the date of death is identified because it is the fair market value of the asset, like a snapshot taken, as of the date of death that's relevant. Now really the crux of this document is in this larger uh, section that we've highlighted in red. You're to identify assets of the decedent. Now let's talk about what that means. That means an asset that has no joint owner, an asset that has no named beneficiary, and an asset that is in the individual name of the decedent. So for example, if the asset was in a trust, that wouldn't go on this. If an asset was jointly held with another person, it wouldn't go on this form, as well as a life insurance policy with a named beneficiary. But any asset in the individual name that doesn't meet those criteria would be listed here. You identify the nature of the asset, as well as its value, and then if there's any liens. So for example, with a house in real, with real estate, you identify the value of that house, either by using the state equalized value or an appraisal or a recent sale. You get to subtract the liens, mortgages, encumbrances that have been recorded or that are attached to that particular asset to come out with that inventory value on the far right. In addition, you get to identify or you should identify any other assets of the decedent. These could include bank accounts, financial institutions, and so on. We generally don't go down to the nitty gritty like, you know, little personal items within a property unless there's a dispute among the, the family. Now, of course, 
it is incumbent upon the personal representative to use a valuation, but there's no guidelines other than real estate as to how the valuation uh, should occur. You can use an appraisal, especially if there's a fight going on, but otherwise it's dependent upon the personal representative to use a reasonable valuation so that the court can calculate that inventory. Now this document really serves two purposes. One, it is for the court to be able to assess that inventory fee, and second, to give the other interested parties an understanding of what assets are flowing through the probate process. To understand the various aspects of this probate process, of course, you can rely on other videos that I've put together or follow the statutes to understand the timeline of process. Now, below the line is also a pretty intuitive self-explanatory section. This is where you identify who's signing the document as well as whether there's an attorney of record. Above that is a really critical sentence though. It is a declaration that that document is being signed under the penalties of perjury. So again, I think everyone has a general sense of what that means. You gotta tell the truth or you subject yourselves to the penalties that perjury provide. Now this process of completing an inventory and presenting it and serving it, uh, for some it's quite easy and for others quite complicated and difficult. If you've got questions about this particular filing or any aspects of the probate process, give us a call at 877-YOUR-FIRM or visit us at theprobatepro.com. We're happy to talk to you and walk you through and explain the process.